the most professional researcher knowledgeable about many aspects of the Wadsworth story. As was mentioned before, he is a descendant from Captain Joseph, and those of you who may not know, Captain Joseph is famous in Connecticut history for being the fellow who took the charter from Connecticut and hid it in the charter oak tree when it was when the king was trying to get it back with the king's agent. So for, for that, we are eternally grateful. Well, we were eternally grateful that he was, he, uh, he left a reputation behind him which made John cringe. <laughs> Well, we, we were talking about yesterday, we said, John was the, the lawyer, and he said, gee, wouldn't it be nice if someone would steal the charter? <laughs> you know, but he didn't incriminate himself. And, and, and Captain Joseph took the hit, you know. A man needs no further introduction. <laughs> my, my topic today is, to, is the early westward movement. The early... <clears throat> The early westward movement of Connecticut. Adrian already explained, I think, the key driver, which is the families. Look at the size of that fam those families and how quickly they expanded. And, ex and each, each one needed a farm, and each one needed some land to feed the, their children. And then they had more children. So by 1740, 1750, Connecticut was in crisis. There was no more land left. And the problem was, was, was increased because all the rich British London types were, or the New Yorkers were coming up to Geneseo, I mean, uh, the city types. And they had inflated money, and they were third and fourth sons of barons and so forth. So suddenly the tiers of the Hartford society were getting aristocratic and oligarchic. And they, they bought up uh, large tracts of land, so, so whatever was left over was bought up. So the, the small farmers were, with their large families, had nowhere to go. And it was a real crisis by 1740, as his uh, ge genealogical chart showed. So Jane, can you go to the next? Uh, so this is J James's house in, in Durham. He was the first guy. He had to get out of Farmington. There was no more land there for him, so he moved on to Durham. And uh, he was a proprietor of Durham. Next day, mm -hmm. so that was uh, 1740. Um, okay. I just, my, we'll come back to this. Let's go to the next one. Wow, all this work verbiage. I'm going to do this in three phases, okay? Before the revolution, during the revolution, and after the revolution. And I'm going to just trace Elijah Wadsworth's uh, path. He was born in 1747. And he was born into this crisis, born just between wars, just before the, um, um, the <laughs> French and Indian Wars, the Seven Year War, and um, in a situation where there was they were running out of land. He was a fourth son, so he he sold his land in Hartford and moved out to Litchfield. He had roots in Litchfield because his mother was a a cook uh, of the the uh, stone-working cooks of Harwinton. And so uh, he had connections out there and he decided to move out there. Another reason was he was a trained at... His father died in 1758 during the, the war, um, probably from diseases that proliferated in the military camps and came back to Hartford. Uh, thousands of men died in those camps out of Fort Fort uh, McHenry and the and the forts up in the, in the Lake Districts because there was no sanitation, bad water, terrible food, uh, cramped conditions, and so forth. And so Joseph the Third died young and left left the family. So the boys were actually raised by Joseph Jr. and even by uh, and um, they their first job was uh, to do field work. And um, the first record we have of Elijah was uh, a record in the Talcott back on the, there's so many stories that we can't consolidate it down. But um, let me just go through, um, this is basically his life, the, the Seven Years' War. Um, he was a blacksmith trained. He was highly trained in the Wadsworth, uh, the Joseph branch of the family were very hands-on. They had extensive farm holdings. They had a sawmill. 
They had a construction business. They had a, 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 a cider, a hard cider manu a wholesale business. They, they were blacksmiths. Uh, Elijah was trained as a blacksmith, and he took up his younger brother Epiphras under his wing and after the father died and trained him as a blacksmith. And they both went out to, hard, to Litchfield together. As soon as they came of age, they sold their land and moved to Litchfield. Um, next, Jane. This was Litchfield. Uh, this house was built in 1753, Oliver Walcott Sr. Um, I want you to have some of these names in mind. Um, Oliver Walcott was the young son of Rod Roger Walcott, the, the long-term deputy governor and uh, head of the assembly um, um, and eventual governor. Um, and he had a large family and several sons. Frederick and Oliver moved out to Litchfield, and he was appointed sheriff because of his, governor, his, his father's influence. And this is the, one of the first frame houses to be built in what was a, a, a bunch of log cabins. Did Elijah build that one? No, um, Elijah uh, moved to, came of age and moved to Litchfield in 17, uh, 69 and 70. I think he built his house in 69 and moved out. It was he could get there in a, in a day's horse ride, so he would. He would um, the family had um, farm hold. There were Wadsworth Holdings out near Bantam that came out of, and um, the Farmington Wadsworths had holdings out in Litchfield County, um, and so did the um, Har the Hartford proprietors had holdings out there too. Also, there were connections to John Marsh, the sort of surveyor and founding proprietor. Um, the Wadsworths were intermarried with the Marsh family, the Cook family, and these early Litchfield families. So you'll see these names again. That's the only reason I put this picture here. This is the only frame house at the time. Next. Name. This is the um, Elisha Sheldon Senior Tavern built in 1760. So just before Elijah comes, these two senior uh, figures. Um, this was a tavern. This was the one place where people congregated from all around Litchfield County. Um, and it was um, <coughs> important because Elijah Sheldon was in one of the, um, in the upper house of the uh, chamber um, <coughs> advising the governor. Um, I'm just trying to give a glimpse of what was there before Elijah came. Mm. The thing about Oliver, Oliver Walcott and, and Sheldon was that both men were leaders in the Connecticut government during the revolution. But before the government, the reason why they got there is because they were appointed by uh, the assembly to open up and negotiate treaties with the Indians in the western lands of Western, the, the western half of Litchfield County was state property. So they negotiated the townships, they surveyed the townships, and they opened up negotiations with the land for Canaan, Kent, and uh, Salisbury at the, at the end of their, um, so they were, they were the government people on the scene who were in, responsible for, they were the law in the, in the town. Um, and they were the ones that were sent to negotiate with the New York uh, delegates to settle the boundary between the western part of Connecticut and the western part of New York. It was a big deal because they were running out of land. So going to the next place. So this is Litchfield. This is a later church built, <coughs> built later. But what, the, what they were members, all members of the First Congregational Society. Next. This is the first house that Elijah built. And it's now torn down. It's being stored in a, in a barn somewhere. Oh, no. But this became the, um, he sold the house. Was um, it Harriet Beecher Snow? Yeah. He, wow. he, he sold, it was on North, North Main Street. It's no longer there. Um, but it was, it was built as his primary residence. And it was his primary residence uh, when his uh, children were being raised. Hmm. Um, and he sold it to Supreme Court Judge Adams in 1790. And he, Adam sold it to Lyman Beecher, and this is where the house where Harry Beecher Stowe was uh, born. Um, cool. I have a theory from circumstantial evidence that because he was a, a trained 
frame construction builder in the high, on a very high level in New York with the Wadsworth um, sawmill and construction operation going there, which is building Hartford, that he participated in building this house for Frederick Walkett. Um, and um, this house was um, eventually became the house of um, uh, Lynn Lord. Lynn Lord was the person who replaced Oliver Walcott. So it's a very tight circle of people. I'm building this through association yeah. connections between Elijah and Oliver and, and the Walkets. Um, Ephraim Kirby was Elijah's best friend during the war, and I think that Elijah and he were in combat um, west of, I mean, east of Philadelphia, near the against the Delaware River. They were they were fighting there, and he was uh, Kirby was chopped up in the battlefield in the fight and was left with seven cuts across his head. But he uh, was rescued by his friends later, and I think Elijah was one. Um, they. Became best friends. Uh, he was a, a judge. Uh, he was a, a lawyer. He wrote the first official court documents and court records in the United States um, as uh, after the war, working with Tappan Reed, Reed with the people, Gould and the people at the Tappan Reed Law School in Litchfield. And um, he was a master mason and formed the Masonic Society of, the, of Connecticut and uh, uh, converted Elijah to masonry, if you could say, or initiated him in, while he was at war. And there's a long history of friendship, and there's a good correspondence between them after the war. So I have a feeling that they bonded in, in that early year, and that he helped build Kirby's house, which explains why they both joined, um, what relationship they had when they both joined the, the Sheldon's Light Horse. Sheldon was the father of Colonel Sheldon of the Light Horse Unit, the 5th Regiment, and then the 2nd Dragoons, which became the 2nd Dragoons in the Continental Service, and those were the troops that um, Elijah and Kirby served together for the first three years of the war. Next. Another house that's important to him is owned by Benjamin Tal Talbot, Tal Talmadge, who is um, Elijah's commander throughout the war. They worked extremely closely together um, as, as a subordinate fighting the, the fight in, in Westchester. Some of these are add-ons that happened later. But this is an important house because, and then there's the, um, see this house was built in 1775 by the, the established that the detail work inside the house, the carpentry work, was by Giles Kilborn. But because of the relationship that Elijah was recruited in 1775 to by um, Sheldon and Sheldon's son, this is the house is next door to Sheldon's tavern. And because um, of the timing of the house built just before the war and, and the fact that his commanding officer bought it after the war, there's, there's a lot of circumstance that suggests that um, this is what Litchfield, as, as, as Adrian was saying that, um, about Maine, wow. this is Litchfield with no trees. This is Litchfield in the 1860s, all agricultural. So it's a whole different view of the town. It's amazing. And it, it, but it, this is these, uh, and I think this is the downtown, and I think this is what pretty much what it looked like by the time the uh, Westward land interest was ongoing. Um, there were, before the war, the first Ohio company was formed in 1768, and it was um, Ben Franklin and his brother William, who was governor of New Jersey, were, were proprietors in this. Huh. And they, th I never knew this until recently, and they, it was a, it was a, a compact guided by Sir William Johnson, who was the, granted by the crown, the ownership of all of Western New York and all the Iroquois lands. And he was the, by the crown. So it makes you realize that this land that we're on today, which is a result of the Phelps purchase and the, their, that's collapse and the repurchase of it by 
William Morris and by uh, foreign corporations, um, a Dutch corporation and a, uh, another, uh, and an English corporation in conjunction with uh, Joseph, I mean, uh, Jeremiah. So this land that was purchased by them had already been, was already owned already wholesale. So you had the Indians out here that everyone was talk, was was concerned about, but actually the land was owned by Sir William Johnson, and they they created this uh, combined company called the first the Ohio Company, which owned two million acres of Ohio and divided it up between them. So there was an inhibiting the population in Connecticut that needed land was inhibited not only by the fact that they had a British dominated ocean on one side of them and a British dominated wilderness filled with British allied Indians on the other who wanted to scalp them. That was not the problem. The problem was Sir William Johnson. He already owned it. So the people in Connecticut couldn't move there. Right? And nobody knows that. Nobody thinks that, oh, this was owned by a crown grant by one person. Same kinds of large purchases were being made in Maine and in, in New Hampshire and places. So they had a problem, a social problem, and a problem of ownership. And they couldn't move there both by Indian treaty and they couldn't move there because of the ownership of these very influential Englishmen. So um, then in 1768, um, and actually in, in 1753, a group of people in um, formed the Susquehanna Company um, and began to think about, some, some people actually began to move into Westmoreland uh, in, in uh, the Susquehanna Valley. But formally, in 1768, the Susquehanna Company was organized and people began to move, move there um, in 1769 under the leadership of John Durkee. Durkee turns up because later he's part of the Highland Command in, uh, under, under, uh, in, uh, with all the other Connecticut uh, regiments stationed in New York with Elijah. In 1769, um, Elijah sold his holdings in Harper and moved there in 1770. But, so Elijah's move westward was not an accident. It was timed in the same at the same time that this these uh, Sus the Susquehanna Company was formed by a private consortium uh, backed by Trumbull and Alphabet Dyer and William Williams and the entire Trumbull government to try to find a way to move west and get <laughs> land. Me, well, yeah. I think maybe you need to explain what Westmoreland is. And was that involved with any claims that Connecticut had to northern Pennsylvania? This is Westmoreland. This is Susquehanna River coming down. And this was the first layout of townships by Connecticut people in, in the Susquehanna Company. It was a corporation formed by people in the eastern part of Connecticut, is what the history books tell you. But if you look into the history, it's not what they tell you. The, this was in... Um, 1754, and this the first page of a two-page list of people who joined the Susquehanna Company from Litchfield. And who's at the top of the list? Oliver Walcott, Esquire, senior owner of that first house. Elisha Sheldon, also the owner of the tavern. His son was, was the colonel of the light horse unit for Litchfield. Elijah was a captain under him. and. Um, uh, also a builder who had been there building these houses in, around in that neighborhood. So anyway, this is, um, before Elijah goes up there, there's a westward looking group of leaders in Litchfield who are supporting and putting dollars into a corporation as proprietors to develop that land in West Westmore. It's a big plan. Elephant Dyer, who was an advisor in the upper house, upper house of of the assembly, um, went to England. John Durkee led a bunch of settlers from Connecticut um, in 1769. Um, the next year, um, in, in, in May, in no, 
November, they were thrown out by, the, by the, a, a bunch of militiamen from Pennsylvania. Um, then they came back in 1771, and they drove out, they drove out the, 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 the Penamites. So there was a war that went on, and uh, hundreds of people died, and uh, people were displaced. And there was um, um, fighting that went on between the Connecticut settlers in this area because the Connecticut Charter that we rescued caused a lot of trouble later um, because it was said you, we owned everything along the Connecticut line all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. And <laughs> 20, year, 20 years later, the king uh, was paid off and he said to the William Penn that, oh, you can have all this land from here over the same zone. So there was a competing charters from the crown as when they were colonies for this area. And there were, there was also treaties that governed the Indians that prevented people from moving into the, this area because of Indian treaties. Well, the Connecticut people are clever. They went out and found some drunken Indian up in, uh, in New York and said, look, we want to move here. Can we pay you 20 bucks? And they said, sure. And they signed a paper. And so they had a, a fictional document that said um, we had Iroquois permission. It was not in conflict with the treaty. And then they had all this money um, and planning and organization behind. They, they, Elva Dyer went to um, England in, um, I think, 1767 and was given a cold shoulder by the British about this project. So he came back empty handed with no permission. But the people went anyway. The large context is a big story, and I'm not going to go into it, but the, the two drivers behind the revolution were the tax situation and, and, and the, um, the problem of be, being trapped in Connecticut, unable to move on. And this corporation was a way around. To move west was came to a head at the time of the revolution, and you had Daniel Boone going into Kentucky next at the same time. This is the Second Dragoons, uh, former at Litchfield uh, Regiment of Rock Life Force. Next. Yeah. OK. Um, during the revolution, only two things that, that, that are really important happened. That um, a very brilliant man you may know about is Samuel Holden, General Samuel Holden Parsons. He's important. He became a very most trusted general, one of the one of the most trusted generals by the Connecticut establishment and the Continental establishment. He was one of the first, along with Benedict Arnold, to anticipate the importance of Ticonderoga, and he was funded people got Connecticut funding into the hands of, um, of, of officers and sent the militia up there. So he he and Arnold together. Um, uh, were important in the seizing of Ticonderoga, which really saved New England. Then later, in, after um, five years of war in 1780, when he was the commander of uh, the West Point and the defenses north of New York, Samuel Holden Parsons, um, wrote a letter to the governor of New York asking him to, if, if, if he would give the blessing to settle all of Western New York, that the, the, the governor Clinton saying, I find it a considerable portion of the officers of the Connecticut line are serious of forming settlements in the western part of the state of New York at the close of the war and have desired me to inform myself whether they can expect any grants from the state for that purpose. And New York can be no better gainer because they'll protect the inner part of this state from the outer. And I believe we shall procure a great proportion, if not the greatest part of our soldiers, to become settlers. So this idea was formalized in 1780 after five years of war, by which time everyone in the army had lost all their income from private income. They had lost their livelihoods. And they began. And by serving at West Point, north of New York, they were 10 miles, well, let's say 20, 20 miles from wilderness. The Indians could come over the hills and attack um, West Point from the, from the west, 
and the British Navy could sail up the river and attack them from the ocean. So the two oceans that were, um, everyone who served at West Point knew how important it was because they were surrounded by these two titanic um, uh, enemies. But this was their solution. And this was visualized first by Parsons and then followed through after the war um, by him and his Confederates. Uh, his, another man named uh, Rufus Putnam, who was the first uh, settled Marietta, Ohio, for the, in the Northwest Territory. Um, these were the two men that were stationed at West Point, along with Durkee, who was from Westmoreland, and two other officers from Westmoreland who were colonels. And they developed this idea. So the idea of formalizing westward movement in New York and in Ohio was came out of the war at this point. That's the only point I have to make. The leadership in the Connecticut line established a plan, and they followed through on that plan after the war. Okay, it was the officers who. who um, this is just a letter from Parsons to Jeremiah. They were they were friends and they were intimates and they were worked together in the military. One is a commissary general and the other is a commander of West Point, so they had to be in touch at all times because all the supplies from Connecticut had to get past, go through West Point and, and, and get down to get down to the to the army. Um, after the war, um, Treaty of Paris is signed in March of uh, 83. What's the first thing that happens? The, 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 the people from Pennsylvania started murdering Connecticut people. And the other terrible thing that happened um, was that um, Connecticut sent um, General James Wadsworth as their delegate to the Continental Congress, which is proof positive they had no interest in working out cooperative relationships with uh, the rest of the states. <laughs> because general, the, the general was a, you could say, a Connecticut nationalist. He believed in the Connecticut ethos, the Puritan values, the, um, the elected assemblies. Every other state, and they'd been fighting New York and Massachusetts all through the colonial period because there were a bunch of rich people that were trying to impose their rule on the assembly, and the, the governors were all appointed. The governor of New York was appointed, the governor of Massachusetts was appointed by the crown. So Connecticut was the only place that had self-rule, and that's why it got overpopulated. Another reason why it became over. everyone who ha had any brains went there, because they at least had a voice of some sort. So um, the second Pennamite War started. So Pennsylvania was attacking Connecticut people. Connecticut fought back and defeated them and threw them out of the, of, of the valley and won that war in a couple of years. But it was brutal and, uh, and nasty. Then Shays' Rebellion, the soldiers who had come back home had no money and no pay and no pension and no life, and they rebelled. And they decided to take an armory and uh, uh, take matters in their own hands and get rid of the Continental Congress. They were put down by the officers, but between, and then the Indians in Ohio started attacking settlements in Ohio, and uh, started attacking in Pennsylvania. So all of a sudden, the Continental Congress had no army, no navy, British and European controlled inlands and, and oceans, and all of a sudden they were just falling apart from within, and they had a, a, um, were being attacked by a, powerful native forces. So they then decided we have to get organized and have a central government because the states aren't talking to each other, the Continental Congress is ineffective and we have no military and I'm a today. <laughs> that's, that's reassuring, right? <laughs> so they got together and as many of the people were officers, Connecticut was very vital in those talks being the most populous state and the most economically viable at the time. And the um, George Washington and the officers of the army were also a presence there. And they were very concerned that they get control of the, the ex-military people that were impoverished. So the whole 
orchestration of the creation of the uh, Constitution came out of this ferment. And it was a way of the um, people with, uh, to get control of these various factors. Um, let, me, uh, yeah. let me interrupt you there, because you started talking about General Roger, who is your ancestor. And you got him as far as uh, Litchfield, but look at the pictures, James. He was involved in those Indian wars out in Ohio. He moved to Ohio. He's a very big figure in Ohio. They named Wadsworth, uh, Ohio, after him. Since the problem with too much context. Yeah, but so this is the first question, and then we'll open it up for more questions. Can you tell us a little bit about his career in Ohio? Absolutely. Kind of jump ahead to that. Okay. Let's go. Elijah was a tremendous, uh, had a lot of energy and was an entrepreneur. He created a splitting mill and a sawmill in Litchfield and uh, ran five different entrepreneurial businesses. But one of the key things, he was a founding member of the Cincinnati with Talmadge and with Jeremiah, and he was in touch with them. Um, the Society of Cincinnati? Yeah. Um, so he, they were, he was, he and all the officers in the Sheldon's Light Horse, and they were all concerned with westward movement. They had invested in, in the Pennsylvania lands before the war. And after the war, um, he was a, an initial investor in the Ohio Company, which was a company that uh, created, bought a couple of million acres in southern Ohio along the Ohio River. And he owned land as a proprietor in Marietta, Ohio from the, from the get-go and was a, pr a first level investor there. Then he was, uh, at the same time, he was created a company, Wadsworth and Bryant, and was an investor for Litchfield people in Westmoreland. And Jer uh, in 84 and 85, Jeremiah, and, and um, it's very important to know that uh, Jeremiah Wadsworth and General James Wadsworth both when they were in Congress in 84 through 87, um, were primary important members on the committees having to do with the westward expansion. They were, they were the ones that dealt with the Indian treaties and the western lands. So this would have been James Wadsworth of Durham, the grandfather of William and James that came out here. No, he, this would have been General James oh, Wadsworth. Uncle. The uncle. The uncle. The granduncle. He had no children. Yeah, the granduncle. Right, so General James and Jeremiah and um, uh, were on the committees of Congress that established the uh, treaties with the Indians and were behind Parsons. They sent Pars General Parsons out to Ohio to treat with the Shawnees and he forced them into a treaty where they gave, gave the lands that were for the Ohio Company um, allowed settlers to settle on those lands. So the treaties were formed, the companies were formed, and the state gave approval in the Land Act of 1787. And that was so, the Western Reserve. So that was that was not even the Western Reserve. That was Southern Ohio. Okay. Elijah was involved in that. He was involved in Western Ireland. And then when he was a, an initial, go on, next, um, the ordinance for the Northwest Territories was formed. Keep going, this, this to Marietta. It was General Rufus Putnam and um, Parsons who were behind this Ohio company. They formed the Ohio company to settle those lands. And then uh, Jeremiah recommended that Parsons uh, and, and uh, um, James recommended that Parsons represent um, uh, be, was made the head judge for the entire Northwest Territory, the Supreme Court judge. And he moved out there to make his, uh, and he was the first purchaser of Western lands from the state of, uh, uh, from, from, from the Ohio Company, and he purchased the salt tract up in Ohio that William also invested in. Are you that was a now? <laughs> I'm getting to him. Um, Anyway, there's a whole history of the unfolding surveys, the ordinances in these 84 and 85, I mean in uh, 1784, just after the war, the two years after the war, these ordinance acts had to be created to divide the land. But these were, 
these were orchestrated by the ex the officers and by Parsons, by um, um, Putnam, by the officers of the Connecticut line, creating these uh, and pushing these these um, uh, land play. And, uh, uh, John Noyes was was a so when finally what happened in 1786 was that the Supreme Court chose. Um, uh, said that the lands in Westmoreland belonged to Pennsylvania, um, and uh, so in compensation, the Congress passed the laws that allowed the uh, Western uh, West Reserve of Western Land in in uh, Ohio. Um, so John Noyes Wadsworth was one of the principal collators of a group of investors that supported this. Uh, I wanted to show that all the different families yeah. were. Involved. And for those that don't realize, John Noyes was the father of William and James who came to USC. Right, right. So he was an organizer for. Thank you. So I have, I have correspondence between him and 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 and, and um, Elijah, because Eli yeah. Elijah was an agent for the Connecticut Land Company on the scene in in um, and represented the Connecticut Land Company. And generally, he was the first postmaster in, in, in the Connecticut Reserve. This is a picture of where the Western Reserve is. This is the Pennsylvania line. And this is the shape of it. You can't see it very well, so we as well move on. It's a big area. It's and this is where area. I grew up as a child. It was always the Western Reserve, but we never knew it was the Western Reserve of Connecticut. The Congress had created <laughs> Connecticut. <laughs> and this, this is where he lived in Canfield in the early in, near the, not it's a good day's ride from, from uh, Pittsburgh. Um, what state is this in Ohio. 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 This is northern Ohio. This Just is Cuyahoga County, 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 right Geauga yeah. County, Portage now, County. Now, the salt tract is lo located on the Mahoning River right about here. And it was 26,000 acres that Why was it Parsons, salt? Yeah. because it was the only place where animals could get salt for anywhere within 200 miles. So it was a very, very important tract of land to the Indians and to the animals, because this is where they were able to stay healthy. They didn't get salt. They would Elijah bought that, or who bought that? Samuel Holden's Parsons. He was the first guy to purchase. That's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm repeating the name again and again, because he was the, it was the, it was the officers in the Connecticut line that, that drove the entire Western movement and the creation of the Northwest Territory, the creation of um, land in Ohio with the Ohio Company, the settlement of those lands, and they did it as a military operation. They moved from a, an, uh, a native culture and wilderness in two, three decades to a place with hot and cold running water and uh, you know <laughs> showers and a university. Now, I, I was reading some on this subject it was claimed that uh, when the Civil War came along, that this area of Ohio, which you just changed its place, in the Western Reserve, was the most patriotic, the most anti-slavery area in the entire country. Uh, it was never in touch. It was. Because it was all made up of these Connecticut patriots who had come moved out there with immense operation. And slavery was prevented by one vote in the Ohio Assembly. In the, Constitutional Assembly of Ohio won vote, but they voted against slavery in, com in conformity with the Northwest Territory. Uh, which sure most of the other them. votes were from the southern part of Ohio. A lot of Virginians and, and others. I won't get into any aspersions, but yes, it was the humanism and the, the various principles that of the North. <coughs> It's, it's a long story. It's a whole story yeah. about uh, cultural We could do a full day seminar and give you four hours. But, but Elijah was... Today. <laughs> sorry. Elijah was there from the beginning. And, but the point I was trying to make was that he formed a, a partnership in support of this uh, distribution of land um, with Oliver Walcott and uh, with Benjamin Talmadge, they bought tracts of land together, the three of them. So they and showed. Did Genesee and Wadsworth invest in some of that land too out here? 
I, I, I thought the general. Yeah, I, that was that was that was later. They but they have tremendous investments out there. But for the west, got a question? Yeah, um, it, it might have been mentioned before, but who are they purchasing these land grants from? Good question. <laughs> well, it was British owned. It was British by. It was British land, and the British had treaties with the Native Americans there, and they kept most of the settlers out to to preserve those treaties, and also their own personal ownership of all the land. Um, so after the part of the Treaty of Paris was that the English ceded the all the Northwest Territory to the United States, to the United Colonies. And now they were the United States. So it was owned by everybody and by the states. But without much of a central state, they couldn't do anything. So they tried to sort out some of these basic land issues in the three years after the war. But it wasn't until the Constitutional um, Assembly and the creation of the formal United States ratified by all the states that they were able to get into the weeds and actually give this land um, to the Connecticut people to be legally owned and purchased and to have deeds against it. So originally, the people who settled in Ohio we're gonna, became. We're going to take a little medical break right now. But, okay. So one of my audience members needs to get some assistance. I'm sorry, I'm so long winded. I have okay. so many questions. <laughs>